Repentance in the Greek. Now, before we begin, just a disclaimer, I don't read, write, or speak Greek, so I am not authoritative on how the Greek should best be translated. I am only doing this video to deal with the nonsense that is perpetuated by many other Christians who also don't speak Greek, by the way, and because even without speaking Greek, it's easy to debunk some of the wild claims that are made regarding this subject. All claims made in this video are substantiated using either a concordance or second-hand information, but sources will be presented on screen where possible. I have questioned two native Greek speakers about some of the issues discussed in this video, one of whom provided me with some very helpful information and resources to prepare for it. And he is a regular subscriber as well. So in video 21, we looked at the Hebrew Old Testament and we considered how God repented. And we saw that repentance and turning are interchangeable. The verbs underpinning those verses may either refer to God repenting or man repenting. Now, obviously, when God repents, it's never about sin. But when man repents, it's only sometimes about sin. It doesn't mean that it's always about sin. I remember that we looked at how people try to play tricks with the fact that there's two words in Hebrew, nakam and shub. And so they'll try to say that, you know, God repenting is a different kind of repentance. And people will do the same trick with the Greek as well, because there's two verbs that underpin the verb repent in English. And one particular verb is more widely used in the verses that deal with sin and also with salvation and the gospel. And the other word is used for more mundane issues. There is one verse in the Greek New Testament that quotes the Hebrew Old Testament where the verb repent is used, referring to God not repenting, and obviously this has nothing to do with sin therefore. This gives us a bridge between the Hebrew word and its equivalent Greek word. And it's Hebrew 721 which quotes Psalm 110 for saying, The Lord has sworn and will not repent. So as you can see, it's got nothing to do with turning from sin. It just means that God won't undo this action. He won't revoke the next bit, that Jesus is the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So as we saw in the previous video, we looked at the Hebrew and the word is Nachem. And it's a variation of this word essentially that's behind Psalm 110 verse 4 that God will not repent. And we saw an instance where this same word is used to refer to man repenting. And sometimes that's even of sin like in Jeremiah 8 6. So the word Nachem in Hebrews is quoted in the Greek using metamelame, which in Strong's is reference number 3338. And the most basic definition of this word is to regret or to repent. And the word essentially has two parts. We've got meta, meaning change or after, and mellow, meaning care or concern. And it can also refer to a change of mind according to Strong's Concordance. The noun form may be translated as remorse, but is never used in the New Testament, so it's not indexed in Strong's Concordance. As we saw with the Hebrew, and does happen in English, but with less variety because we use more words, Greek verbs may have variants depending on the context, such as the tense and the object of the verb. So, for example, there'll be variants of metamelame that include, but not exclusively, metamelithes, metamelithite, and metamelithisete. And for simplicity's sake, as we did with the Hebrew, we won't delve into all the different variations because it doesn't really matter too much. We'll just look at the base word from the concordance to make our definition and what whichever word has a unique reference number in Strong's. So if a word uses a variant, I'll just really use the base word for interpretation. And I apologise in advance for my mispronunciation because, as I said, I do have a Greek subscriber, so he'll know that I'm doing a terrible job of pronouncing these words. So here's a couple of other verses using the same verb, metamelame. So we've got 2 Corinthians 7, 8, for I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. And then you've also got Matthew 27, 3, where Judas repented of uh, betraying innocent blood. So in total, metamelame is used in six verses of the New Testament, and our King James Bible consistently translates it as repent or repented. Modern Bibles substitute this with many other words, and they don't necessarily translate it into the same word every time. For example, they may translate it as remorse or regret, and then in Hebrews 7.21, they'll just translate it as the Lord will not change his mind. But there are other Greek words used as well. So if we take, for example, Mark 1.4, this is repentance in the noun form, the baptism of repentance, as it were. Now, when we looked at the Hebrew, the word Nachum really only had one noun equivalent that was ever used in the whole Old Testament. In the Greek, we have the noun used about 26 times, if I recall correctly. And so this suggests that in the Greek language, uh, the noun was perhaps more frequently used, or perhaps repentance could also be seen as a status, not just an action. So when you convert and you get saved, not only have you repented, 
but you have now reached the, the status of repentance, as it were. And that's why, for example, the Bible might say things like works meet for repentance, because if you hadn't repented, there'd be no benefit in doing those works. So they're only meet for people who have repented, aka repentance. So the noun in our Bible comes from the word metanoia. So in Strong's, this is reference number 3341. The definition in Strong's is a change of mind or repentance. And the word essentially has two parts. You've got meta, meaning change or after, and noia, meaning mind or understanding, reason, think or perceive. Strong's definition will also give change of inner man and compunction with guilt and penitence because the Greek is sensationalized just as the English and Hebrew are sensationalized by many Christians. So that's the noun and we've seen the verb metamelame which is used only a handful of times but there is another verb that's used far more commonly and this verb is metaneo and the verb pretty much matches the noun i.e. it's a change of mind or repent with additional dressed up definitions and it comes from the word for change uh, or after and the word for th mind or think. This verb is used far more widely and so obviously the most commonly quoted statements will use it such as Matthew 3 2 repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke 13 3 except you repent you shall all likewise perish. Acts 2 38 repent and be baptized every one of you. Acts 8 22 repent therefore of this thy wickedness and Revelation 2 22 except they repent of their deeds. Now, there is another word that's also used in the Bible, and that's ametimelitos, which is basically an adjective form of metamelame, but with a negative prefix, although it's translated to English as a noun in one of the two verses that use it. So you've got Romans 11, 9, for the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance, and that's, that's translated into the noun rather than adjective. And then the other example comes from 2 Corinthians 7.10, where godly sorrow works repentance to salvation not to be repented of. And I've coloured the noun repentance in blue because that's actually translated from metanoia. It's the repented of that's translated from ametimeritos. So the claim being made, essentially, by the repent of sins messengers is that metanoia and metanoia is always used in the salvific statements and verses that are undeniably about sin, such as repent and believe the gospel, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, repent or you shall perish, repent of your wickedness or her fornication or their evil deeds. Metamelame is always used in non-salvific statements and more mundane statements of regret, such as, for example, in reference to God in Hebrews 7.21. So this is a very similar issue to what we dealt with in the last video when we looked at the two words in Hebrew. We've got two words in Greek and different claims are being made about each word. So when God repents, it's this word, but when we have to turn from sin or get saved, it's this word. And so because this same word is used for the verses about turning from sin, and it's used for the same verses about salvation, even when sin is not mentioned, therefore repent of your sins to be saved because it's the same word. But once again, as we saw with the Hebrew, it's one of those almost but not quite actually true statements. It's a false claim. It's just not immediately obvious that it's false. So the example is uh, John the Baptist's repentance. So to begin with, if we compare Matthew's and Luke's account of John's preaching, Matthew quotes John directly, so it's the verb, metaneo is used, whereas Luke, as a narrator, is summarising the story but not directly quoting him, so it uses the, the noun. So obviously the verb metaneo is interchangeable with metanoia because one's the verb and one's the noun. But in summary, one and the same thing. But what's interesting is now multiple times I've used this example in the series, I've referred to Matthew 21, 32 to define what repentance means here. Jesus is referring back to John the Baptist's preaching of repentance and essentially says that the publicans and harlots, which are types of sinners, believed him and the chief priests did not metamelame that they might believe him. So Jesus uses metamelame to define John the Baptist's repentance as believing the message that he was preaching, not turning from sin. Nothing in this verse states whether the publicans and harlots turned from their sins or not, and therefore it doesn't define that as the metamelame here. So in Matthew 3, John the Baptist said metaneo, but when Jesus refers back to it, he says metamelame. So it's interesting that both metamelame and metaneo come from Matthew's gospel account, yet he's used different words. And metamelame is instead referring back to the metaneo, which is the actual quote. So it makes sense to assume that metaneo is probably the literal quote that John said, but Jesus is just referring back to it. So he wouldn't quote John directly. He's just summarizing what John was preaching. And he simply uses an alternative verb to do it. Now, of course, this is where the false prophets get desperate and they say things like, well, Jesus wasn't interpreting John's repentance 
John's metanoia was about turning from sin. So it's just here in Matthew 21 that Jesus is getting at the chief priests for not believing. So as well as repenting of sin because of the metanoia, they should have also metamelamed and believed him as well. So they'll say metanoia is changing your sinful lifestyle, metamelamy is changing your intellectual ascent, and then metanoia you could say encompasses both of these things, I guess. Well, look, if this doesn't do it for you, I don't really know what does. I don't know what else I can do for these people. Later in Acts, we have Paul essentially preaching the same message. He's referring back to John the Baptist's message of repentance. And he uses the noun, just like Luke's gospel uses the noun, and calls it the baptism of repentance. So it's exactly the same terminology used here. And once again, just as with Jesus in Matthew 21, 32, Paul is interpreting John the Baptist's message of metanoia that they should believe on him. No mention of whether they should turn from sin or not. So metanoia is the noun, which has more similarity with metaneo, but it's still interchangeable and equivalent with Jesus' message of metamelame. It still encompasses the same underpinning words. So when John preached the baptism of repentance, Paul reflects back on this in Acts 19 and defines it as they should believe on him. He didn't say that they should turn from their sins. That's not how Paul claims to have understood John the Baptist's metanoia. Well, the thing is about Paul's statement here is shut up. And if we go back to the verse I read earlier from 2 Corinthians, we only looked a few slides ago. We saw the noun coming from metanoia, which is the noun for metaneo, while the not to be repented of comes from ametemelitos, not ametaneos. And the implication here being that once godly sorrow works repentance towards salvation, once that has happened, one will never repent away from it. So it's an irreversible repentance. There are also some secondary sources we could use to see metaneo and metamelame being used interchangeably. The first source that comes to mind is the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's believed to have first been translated and written in the 3rd century before Christ, uh, though since we only have fragments from that period, most manuscripts are dated a few centuries after Christ. So this basically came about because following the Babylonian exile and the 400-ish years between the Testaments, Greek and Aramaic had displaced Hebrew as the commonly spoken language among the Jews. So although it's a Greek translation and not the original Hebrew, some surviving manuscripts are actually dated far older than most of the Hebrew Masoretic text. So modern Bibles now have started to take the Septuagint into account when it differs from the Hebrew in some key verses. Now, as a disclaimer, I should point out that your King James Bible in English is based on the Hebrew Masoretic text exclusively, not the Greek Septuagint text. So when we justify our doctrine from the Old Testament, we are basing this on the Hebrew, not the Greek, because in some verses they do differ. However, where there are no conflicts between the Hebrew and Greek text, the Septuagint is still useful to show us how the Hebrew is translated into its Greek equivalent particularly in Koine Greek, which is the same language that our New Testament was written in, the same language used by Jesus and the apostles when speaking in Greek. So, just as we looked at Nachum and Shub in this episode, we can see how the Septuagint will see how the Greek, the Koine Greek, translates Nachum in the Old Testament. So I've handpicked a few verses. Uh, let's just see how they're translated into Koine. So we have Genesis 6-7, and uh, this is where it repents the Lord that he made the earth. It's a variant of Nachum, and it's translated using a variant of Metamelame, essentially. Now, Hosea 11-8 is an interesting one, and I actually overlooked this in the last video when we looked at the Hebrew. This is an unusual one because it's the only verse that uses repentings. That's quite an unusual variant because the Hebrew Nechum is also ever so slightly different to Nochum. And what makes this doubly interesting is that the Greek translation in the Septuagint uses metamalia, which is the noun form of metamelame. This noun is never used in the New Testament, only metanoia is used. This is the one instance of the noun for metamelame being used, and it's in the Old Testament. Now, given the two verses that we've seen so far, somebody will probably say, well, that's God repenting and it's metamelame, so you've just proven it's a different Greek word. Well, okay, have it your way then. Let's look at a few metaneos. So I've just shown you Genesis 6-7. Let's compare that side by side with Jeremiah 4-28 because both of these verses use the exact same variant of Nakam in the Hebrew. You can see the written Hebrew there. It's the exact same letters. Yet they are translated differently in the Greek Septuagint because in Genesis it's translated as metamelithin. 
whereas in Jeremiah it's translated as metanoiso. So Genesis 6-7 uses a variant of metamelame, but Jeremiah 4-28 uses a variant of metaneo. They're both about God repenting and both use the exact same Hebrew form, yet they've translated one verse into a different verb. Let's look at another example, Amos 7.3. This is God repenting again, not about sin, obviously. And the Greek translation uses a variant of metaneo, not metamelame. Metaneo does not imply turning from sin, because according to this verse, God metaneoed. Here is another example of God repenting in Jonah 3.9. And again, it uses a variant of metaneo, not metamelame. So that's God repenting. What about man repenting? So in Exodus 13, 17, we have an example of man repenting, nothing to do with turning from sin. If anything, they would be repenting to sin if they carried this out, that they would repent and go back to Egypt. And this uses a variant of metamelame. In Jeremiah 8, 6, this is about repenting of sin, still uses the Hebrew word nakam, of course, and it does use a variant of metaneo. In Jeremiah 31, 19, and this is actually numbered differently in the Septuagint because the, the numbers don't match, but this uses a variant of metaneo, even though the repenting is man repenting and it's not about sin. So we see metaneo being used both for man repenting of sin and repenting of something that's not strictly sin. Now, just as a disclaimer, I didn't find any verses in the Septuagint where metamelame was used for turning from sin. That doesn't mean that no such verse exists. Rather like our King James Bible, the Septuagint uses other words for turn, and some verses that say repent in Hebrew or English are actually phrased quite differently in the Septuagint. And later in the video, you'll probably understand why it doesn't use metamelame in that kind of way. But we've seen it proven that these words are both interchangeable. They're both used in reference to God repenting, even from the same Hebrew variant in some cases, and both used in the contexts that are not about sin. So those words were used interchangeably in the Koine Greek that our New Testament is translated from, the language that Jesus and the apostles were able to speak. But I also found this interchangeability in modern Greek too. Now, as many of you know, in English, I am King James only on this channel. Uh, we do not reference other Bibles, except in some cases where I have to compare a few things. Now, I am yet to do a video in this series about some of the problems with repentance in our modern Bibles and how they butcher the definition by substituting it with other words. So I can't testify whether that same problem happens so extensively in Greek translations. Obviously, they're a little bit closer to source. So I can't say how integral or accurate modern Greek translations are. But even though Greek speakers could understand the albeit archaic Koine Greek, there are still various attempts to produce modern Greek translations of the Bible. And I came across this little nugget of information. On new version, there are several Bible versions in modern Greek available. I mentioned earlier in this video that Matthew 21, 32 uses a variant of metamelame, even though Jesus is referring back to John the Baptist's metaneo. In modern Greek, metamelame is now an archaic word. Most Greek speakers will probably instead use a word metaniono, which translates to English as regret, and is more etymologically similar to metaneo, i.e. change or after and mind and think. So I found two Bible translations in modern Greek, both translated by the Hellenic Bible Society. And instead of using the original metamelame in Matthew 21, 32, they have instead substituted it with metaneo, not metaniono. They essentially use the same variant of metaneo that can be found in Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized, and Acts 3, 19, repent and be converted. If metaneo is really a different kind of repentance than metamelame, they could have done what English Bibles do by substituting it entirely with a completely different word. For example, the ESV says, you did not afterwards change your mind instead of repent and not afterwards. The Greek translators could have likewise substituted metamelame with something else like metaneono, but they didn't. How dare they use metaneo, thereby suggesting that it's perfectly interchangeable with metamelame and doesn't automatically mean turning from sin. It's just so rude. How dare you? So even with all these lordshippers and sinless perfectionists bombarding us with this line that metaneo is a different kind of repentance than metamelame, some Greek translation committee somewhere decided that the words were interchangeable enough to replace metamelame with metaneo because metamelame is an archaic word so as to make it more intelligible to a modern Greek speaker. Incredible. You know, it's like native Greeks just don't know how to speak Greek anymore. So they have to come to us English-speaking lordshippers who did two semesters of biblical Greek to correct it for them. Unbelievable, a disgrace to their own country.
Now, someone might object to this and say, well, you have had to stretch to modern Greek or Old Testament translation sources to prove metamelamine and metaneo being used interchangeably. Your example in Matthew 21, 32 and 2 Corinthians 7, 10 are not very concrete. You still can't prove that metaneo or metanoia in the original Koine Greek New Testament is not about sin or at least not about salvation. It's either one or the other. Well, if you've been following this series so far, you already know that's completely absurd because we've looked at all of these different passages like sinners to repentance and repent and be baptised. And we've seen what the definition of repentance is from those passages. Like when Jesus was preaching repentance, there's no mention of sin. So how is it about repenting of sins then? But we just looked at the context to see what the repentance was about. However, even if they're not about turning from sin, people will still say that they have salvific connotations. It'd be very difficult to argue that like repent and be baptised for the remission of sins is not tied with your conversion to getting saved. So if we have some verses about turning from sin, I mean, it's the same word used for verses about salvation, and the New Testament doesn't use metaneo or metanoia repentance in such a common way as the Old Testament does, you know, when it said that God repented, it's from Nacham, it's quite common, not really so common in the Greek New Testament, then perhaps we can't prove that metaneo or metanoia in the New Testament is never about salvation? Try me. In Hebrews 12, 17, it refers to Esau being unable to find repentance and its metanoia, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, if you go back and read the story of Esau in Genesis 25 and 27, it never actually says that he tried to repent or that he could not repent. Genesis never describes Esau's story as one of repentance, but this is how the writer of Hebrews is describing it. And, you know, people, of course, try to make this story all about salvation and suggest that that's how the writer of Hebrews is describing it. But the writer of Hebrews is not describing Esau as repenting for salvation or trying to and couldn't. He's using an Old Testament story allegorically to make a point about salvation, perhaps in the New Testament. The story of Esau, if you read it, not really about salvation in of itself. Sure, it's a picture, but it's not about the literal issue. And despite the way that Esau is condemned in the New Testament, in the way that it describes him, he was actually blessed later in his life in Genesis, and he did reconcile with Jacob. So Genesis actually does look on Esau quite favourably, and technically it was Jacob who sinned against Esau, if you want to get really technical. So Esau's inability to obtain the blessing had nothing to do with repentance that leads to salvation, or even repenting of sin, really. Genesis never describes him as being able to seek repentance or being unable to, but the Greek New Testament still uses metanoia to describe his situation. So you could apply this in other ways. For example, when Samson did some stupid things and was blinded by the Philistines, even if he repented of his sins, quote unquote, he couldn't restore his life and get his sight back to the way it was before. So like Esau, he would find no place for metanoia or repentance. And obviously Hebrews 12 will perhaps need its own video one day. We can go into a bit more detail about that. But let's move on to the next point. Even secular literature uses variants of metaneo and metanoia in a secular way. For example, Plutarch's Moralia Volume 2 uses metanontes, but it isn't anything to do with sin. And you can see the Greek and the English compared side by side there if you want to pause it and read that little section there. Now, secular literature obviously doesn't prove what biblical repentance is, but it does show that in the language that Jesus and the apostles spoke, metaneo can be used to describe changes of mind that have nothing to do with turning from sin. So therefore, if you can't explicitly prove that turning from sin is the context of repentance, you cannot infer turning from sin from the word repent. If you want to try and make that claim, going back to the Greek is going to count against you, not for you. So what's the difference, you might wonder? So let's finish this video by trying to grasp the real distinction, really, between metamelame and metaneo, if you really want one, and a wider application of repentance. Is there really any actual difference between these words? How would a native Greek speaker understand the difference? Is the Holy Spirit being confusing by compelling the writers of the Bible to use different words? So I once asked a native Greek speaker her opinion on the difference between metaneo and metamelame. 
And she actually had to think about it for quite a few seconds and struggled to give me an answer at first. But she, she scratched her head and thought about it. And the best answer that she could come up with is that, well, maybe metamelame is more like a change of action. Metaneo is more like a change of mind. But the thing is, we see the Bible, the opposite is also true. Metaneo being used as a change of action in some cases and metamelame being used as a change of mind. And I asked her if, if I could just use metaneo in an ordinary conversation. Like, I was going to go to this supermarket, but then I metaneoed and I went to that supermarket. And she said, well, you could say this, it would just sound a bit strong. Well, it's just like in English, if I said, I was going to go to this supermarket, I repented and went to another. It just sounds weird. There's nothing wrong with it so much. Because we don't really use repent in English in non-religious contexts most of the time, with some rare exceptions. And I was talking to her about all this stuff with the modern Bible translations and how people make these wild claims about the Greek. And she just asked me, why don't they just ask a Greek speaker? I, good question. But then they couldn't hyper-spiritualise the definition of repentance, could they? Now, I've also asked another native Greek who's a subscriber to this channel, and he's very, very kindly responded to some questions that I had about the Greek in preparation for this video. But even he was quite cautious, and he said he's scared about telling people stuff about the Greek language, just in case he wasn't fully correct on what he said. And he did some uh, more lookups to get some more clarity for me. So he found me this fantastic resource, and basically it's a question posed on... Um, a Greek learning and teaching website to ask questions about the Greek language, and the instructor answered this question. As well as metaneo and metamelame, the questioner was also asking about metanyono, which is more common now in modern Greek, but not used in the Bible. Now, the questioner was asking based on the modern pronunciation and spelling of metaneo, so it, he actually asked about metano. If we say metaneo and metano, it's the same word, it's just it's changed over time. So I'll post a link to that forum in the video description if you want to take a look, but the instructor basically gave this answer. She said that all of the following words mean regret. But here are the differences. Metaniono is the word for regret in modern Greek, so it is most likely that if a Greek speaker wants to convey regret, this is the word they will probably use. It's quite an ordinary word and doesn't carry particularly religious connotations. Metano, the modern pronunciation of metaneo, is an older form of the word but is used in more formal instances, particularly in religious contexts, just like the word repent in English. And then metamelame is actually an archaic word that's no longer used in modern Greek. So you might say that perhaps metaniono has uh, replaced it. So you might think up to this point, well, okay, there's somewhat interchangeability there, fine. But why did God have to confuse us by using these different words in the first place? Why couldn't the Holy Spirit move the New Testament writers and speakers to just use one word? Or why couldn't Peter or Jesus say metamelame for the kingdom of heaven is at hand or metamelame and be baptised or something like that? I submit to you that if they did say that, it wouldn't make much difference because even after you show people that God repented and even after you show people how the Septuagint uses both words interchangeably and even after you show people the same word in Hebrew used for God and man and all this stuff, they still insist that repentance means to turn from your sins anyway. So you're wrong because I said so. I casually glanced through the concordance just to see how metaneo and metamelame are used linguistically. So I noticed that very often metaneo is used as an intransitive verb where Jesus or Peter or John the Baptist would say repent, but with a few exceptions, the immediate verses didn't always make it entirely obvious what is being repented of exactly. For example, repent and be baptised or repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For verses such as these, the verse itself doesn't make it very clear. We need to understand the entire discourse more holistically, which is what we've already done in this series as we've looked at these different passages about repentance. So when we consider John's message of repentance, for example, when he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that's not very obvious what's being repented of. Okay, the kingdom is near. I understand that bit, John. But what do I have to do exactly to repent? What do I do, John? How do I repent? So you really have to look at John's entire dialogue to understand what the message is about. Same thing when Peter said, repent and be baptised. Baptism doesn't really make it very clear how we repent exactly. So we cannot ascertain the definition of repentance from the verse itself. We have to look at Peter's entire dialogue. When Jesus said, repent, or you shall all likewise perish. Okay, fine, I need to repent, but repent of what, Jesus? How do I repent? What do I do? Where the context of repentance is more obvious, and metaneo may even be used as a transitive verb, it is typically given as a commandment. So, for example, repent of this thy wickedness is both a commandment and a transitive verb. So when Jesus says repent, he's 
not documenting something that happened. He's giving a directive. He's commanding something. So metaneo is more appropriately used. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent or else I come quickly. Repent and do the first works. Metamelame is used in more miscellaneous ways, where repentance is more of an observation rather than a commandment. For example, when Judas repented, or when Paul did repent, then did not repent of his letter to the Corinthians. Much in the same way, metaneo is a good foresight word, i.e. I repent from this day forward, whereas metamelame is perhaps more suited to a hindsight word, rather like regret in English. For example, I regret something that happened before. So when the Bible says Judas repented of slaying innocent blood, or Paul repented then did not repent of his letter, these are not commandments going forward. Nobody told Judas to repent, nobody told Paul to repent or not repent. The writers are just narrating what happened or didn't happen in the past. So it's a narration or an observation rather than a commandment. The New Testament never uses metamelame as a forward-pointing commandment or directive. I'm not sure if the Old Testament Septuagint does, because in those verses we looked at earlier, they weren't really commanding anybody to repent. So Septuagint, I'm not really sure. Metamelame is also used as an intransitive verb, but it is more obvious from the verse itself what is or is not being repented of. Unlike the intransitive metaneo, we don't need to study the entire chapter or dialogue to understand the metamelame. The verse is obvious as a standalone verse. So for example, the Lord swear and will not repent, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We know what the Lord won't repent of. He won't repent of Jesus being the priest after the order of Melchizedek. We don't need to study the entire chapter of Hebrews to understand what God will not repent of. And then when Paul said he did and then did not repent or regret of his letter to the Corinthians, we don't need to read the whole book of the Corinthians or the, even the entire chapter to understand his message of repentance. The verse is obvious in itself. The idea that words are interchangeable but used in slightly different ways sometimes should not be some absurd or confusing concept to us. The same thing happens in English and it's not confusing for anybody who has a competent grasp of the language. It may be confusing or harder to grasp if you are not a fluent speaker of a given language, so foreign speakers may struggle with some nuances. So we saw that earlier metaneo comes from a change of mind, metamelame comes from a change of care or concern. Consider these two statements in English. You could say, I don't mind if you want to go on a trip for three days, I'll be okay on my own. Or you could say, I don't care if you want to go on a trip for three days, I'll be okay on my own. Both of these statements express apathy or passiveness towards a particular matter. Having said that though, I don't mind usually indicates a neutral or positive response and is typically used in an approving way or a polite way. Whereas I don't care usually indicates a negative response and is typically used sarcastically or rudely or to dismiss the conversation altogether. I don't mind can be used in a negative way depending on how you express it verbally, but it is probably not preferable in written communication to express negativity. I don't care can be used in a positive way depending on how you express it verbally, but it is probably not preferable in written communication to express positivity. Depending on the context and circumstances, sometimes they are perfectly interchangeable. So even though mind and care are two different words and moderately interchangeable in that example, there are situations where those words are definitely not interchangeable. When you get on an elevator and the automatic voice says, mind the doors, it would sound a bit weird if it said care for the doors. Likewise, child minding services and child care services may have different connotations. Some words could be used as an alternative, but we just don't use them in certain ways because it would just sound weird to say it. So I remember one time I was in Italy and I remember a bus ticket vending machine and it had a button that said more selections. It did make sense and I could understand it, but in English we would normally say more options. So the translation wasn't wrong, it just sounded weird. I looked up metaneo and metamelame and metaneono on the Greek Wiktionary and ran my browser's translator on each word separately. It converted each word like for like in the following ways. Metano or metaneo is repent. Metamelame is repent. Metaniono is regret. And these are the verbs. And then the nouns, metanoia is repentance and metamelia is remorse. In English, there are subtle differences between them insofar as regret simply means that you wish you hadn't done something, but doesn't have to convey a strong emotional feeling necessarily. Remorse often includes regret, but typically means to have more guilty feelings and probably an intention not to repeat said action. 
Repent is used almost exclusively in religious discourse. Christians cannot even agree amongst themselves what it means. Nevertheless, it's fair to say that if you repent of hurting your brother or sister in Christ, you probably regret it too. And if you have really, really hurt them, you may also hopefully feel remorseful and will commit to repent and not do it to them again. Now in English, remorse isn't a verb. You can say, I regret or I repent, but you can't really say, I remorse, because it's only a noun, not a verb. So to express remorse as a verb, you would actually have to say, I regret. So they're only interchangeable as nouns. And concerning intransitive verbs and commandments, rather like metamelomy, regret doesn't operate very well as a standalone instruction in English. So if you said, regret for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or regret and be baptised, it sounds weird because people would be thinking, well, regret of what? What am I supposed to be regretful about? So repent operates better as a standalone verb and as a commandment, just as metaneo does in Greek. So in conclusion, what can we learn from this? In a strange roundabout way, this was a lesson to teach you what you apparently did not need to be taught. Words can be interchangeable with other words, yet certain words are more appropriate than others in certain contexts. We don't actually need to go back to the Greek because we somehow can't figure it out in English. Rather, if you go back to the Greek, then you will come across the exact same problem in English because the language itself is not the problem. Faulty interpretation is the problem. The problem is that Christians dress up, sensationalise and embellish the definition of repentance to turn it into something that it's not in any language. In the English-speaking world, you will hear Charles Spurgeon and Tertullian wannabes making fanciful speeches like repentance is the vomit of the soul, a complete conversion of man's inner being. In the Greek-speaking world, we have orthodox priests making fanciful statements like metanoia is a transformation of the man into a Christ consciousness and a cleansing of the soul in confession in God's spiritual hospital. Yes, I have heard these terms used. Statements like these are so poetic and fluffy and heavenly minded, but it's really just word salad. Long, fancy words being strung together, not forming any meaningful or practical sentence that I can actually act upon. And they're not quoting or referring to the Bible when they say these things. They're just trying to copy Charles Spurgeon, or they're trying to copy Tertullian, or they're just trying to copy some other relic from the past who did the exact same thing. And they want to be seen of men with the great swelling words. Now, I've never done this in this series before, but as we draw this video to a close, I just want to thank a brother in Christ who is one of my subscribers and a native Greek speaker. So apologies for pronunciation, but I want to thank Brother Stephen Kiagiadakis. Um, I hope you don't mind being mentioned, but obviously your YouTube handle is public, so I, you know, I assumed that you'd be okay with it. I wanted to thank this person and acknowledge him publicly because he has been very kind in answering some questions I had while preparing for this video, and he's given me some great resources to look up a bit more information about the Greek language. So if you've listened this far, brother, I just want to thank you very much for your help and God bless. This is No Nonsense Christianity reminding you that nowhere in the Bible does it say repent of your sins to be saved.